We're looking to do some ambitious projects around ecological restoration on the land. Since this is at a larger scale than we are all accustomed to, we know realistically we will have to implement our ideas section by section. This requires us to constantly zoom in and out of the landscape, imagining how each section will not only look and function as a unit, and how we may utilize and enjoy it, but also how it will interact with and contribute to the greater ecosystem around it. Reclaiming the old nursery in the hopes of establishing it into a native insect meadow was one section that we started on back in the fall of 2020 and for which we'll continue to work on establishing throughout this year. The lawn area around the common house is also another section we began to experiment with in the fall of 2021. Now this area is roughly broken up into thirds, whereby we are experimenting with replacing a lawn entirely with early bulbs for pollinators and then sowing over with low mo grass seed mix, which is native to the United States, including Butalua gracilis or blue grama grass, Butalua dactyloides, otherwise known as buffalo grass, and Festuca rubra, which is creeping red fescue. A small portion of that area, which appears to be wetter, was seeded over with approximately 20 low-growing native sedges and rushes, including various species of carex and juncus. A second area involved leaving the current lawn mix and then using a bulb machine to insert early spring blooming bulbs underneath the sod. And a third area abutting the pond, which we noted had a greater diversity of grasses, sedges, and forbs, we are letting naturalize and go to seed. The area that we're planning on concentrating on this year is a swathe of land we're calling interstitial. The interstitial separates the primarily oak, hickory, pine forest from the future meadow. This area had also largely been neglected, taken over by multiflora rose and Japanese honeysuckle, but also planted with quite a number of Norway spruce, which I'll come back to later. Now, we're planning on establishing an agroforestry system based on diverse polyculture in the forest area behind the interstitial, whereby we can work with the pre-existing hickory, oak, and pine, but also introduce some pawpaw and persimmon, prunus, ribes and rubus, vitus, allium like the wild leeks we have, and edible fungi, for example. The interstitial, which spans a little over one acre along the length of the driveway, can really be a beautiful and welcoming section of land as one enters onto the property. It also faces south, so it gets really nice light, and we'd want to manage that area so that some of the light still penetrates into the future agroforestry area. The Norway spruce, which is currently heavily planted in that area, provides little wildlife value and can easily get 60 feet tall and a 30 foot spread and really block out the light in that area. So we'll likely end up taking the majority of those out of the landscape and replacing with a more diverse set of woody species that can also act like a polyculture, but perhaps one geared a bit more towards insects, birds, and wildlife. Okay, so one of the big projects this year is going to be this area of land, which we had been calling the interstitial, or I had been calling it the interstitial, and then Sonder and Joey had no idea what I was talking about, but it really separates the forest from the rest of the meadow area over here. This area where it's bermed up is gonna be, you know, an orchard more or less that kind of transitions into meadow. But this has been interesting. You'll see that Sonder actually built these frames so we could just imagine where a potential greenhouse would be. Now, I don't want to get anybody too excited because we are probably not going to get to a greenhouse this year. Unfortunately, it's just, we're doing too much renovation and landscaping and all that kind of stuff. There's only so much time and it would be another cost that we probably wouldn't be able to bear this year. But it's roughly going to be here, which means I think these are all actually Norway, Norway spruce. So if you could see the cones up there on that one, that looks like a Norway spruce to me. This had been a tree that was 
uh, brought in and it's really fallen out of favor. And because this was an old nursery, I think what happened is that people stopped buying the Norway spruce and then the former owner just started to dot them through here. Now these are gonna get very large and very aggressive. It's gonna kind of shade out the area and that's actually not what, what we wanna do. We wanna transition nicely from the meadow, maintain this land, probably take out some of these dead or dying trees or let them drop on the ground and then actually put a little agroforestry area back here. So, kind of pulled out my black book here. Uh, this is where I actually make a lot of notes about plants that I think are interesting for you know certain areas. And we want to really do like loose permaculture principles here. And we did a nice walkthrough through the forest. And there's some beautiful native trees, sub canopy and canopy trees that we already have in here that I'd like to see and be brought out. And it's very challenging for me to separate kind of beauty from utility. We'll be roughly maintaining this area to around 40 to 50% canopy coverage, and we'll focus on planting in layers. In permaculture, there is an emphasis on planting in layers to mimic a natural ecosystem. These layers may include the taller canopy layer, the subcanopy, shrub layer, herbaceous layer, ground covers, underground roots, tubers, and bulbs, vines and climbers, the fungal layer, and wetland areas if present. I mean, if you look at this, this is Dacus carota, and then we have a lot of goldenrod here that are throughout the area. So this got pretty weedy. We did some good job cleaning out the multiflora rose and also the honeysuckle. There's a number of them that escaped our grips, but we'll have to manage that. And I think we'll manage that soon after all the snow disappears because the snow tends to flatten things. This stuff you could see, these berries that have been left on here, this is Ilex verticillata. So these are really pretty and these are native, but these are probably ornamental ones that he had planted here because they're obviously planted in such a nice row. You could see this, this is uh, Cornus. So this is our native dogwood. I don't know if he planted this or not. It's obviously, um, it's quite popular. Um, it tends to get eaten a lot down, but it needs to actually be cut back in order to maintain some of these uh, young red, this young red look on its stems. So anyway, so I wanted to share this interstitial with you because I'm sure you guys have some really interesting ideas as well and maybe suggestions. There are a number of plants that I've starred on my book here that I know that I want, uh, that I'd like to see for us. And one is, and I'm surprised it's actually not in this wood, is Celtis occidentalis, which is hackberry. It's a great plant for wildlife and birds. And our forest, to sum it up, is in a little bit of dire straits. After walking through it with a couple of foresters, you know, we have no regeneration within our forest because of deer pressure. We're dealing with that, with actually removing some of the deer from that area by doing deer exclusion and seeing what comes back up. The deer obviously that still have like 70 plus acres that they could roam that aren't fenced in, uh, but we'd like to see what happens with that. And we probably wanna do some enrichment planting. And I think by adding new species that are native to this area, can't hurt. So uh, Celtis occidentalis, hackberry is one of them. We already have hawthorn in here and I'd like to see that be brought out. So some crotagus and pin cherry. We have some cherry. Cherry has a tendency to get pretty buggy, but I think if we could dot it throughout the landscape and not all next to one another, it might not be bad. So I'm thinking Prunus pennsylvanica, which is a uh, pin cherry. Again, has a really nice, I'm trying to think about flowers that look beautiful so we could actually enjoy the beauty but also berries or fruits or droops for the wildlife and birds because we are wildlife and bird lovers as well. Then we have a lot of amelanchier which is service berry already in the forest and that's a beautiful sub canopy tree. It's a popular ornamental. It gets really beautiful white flowers and service berry is also a berry that you can make into jams but also a very popular 
wildlife and bird food. So we have Arborea and Lavis that we could bring in. Cersus canadensis has been planted here. It's just on the northern edge of its range. And I've seen that there are Cersus canadensis, small little ones that we actually dug up. We had to dig up because we were digging up certain areas. So they are seeding here, which is really good. They're an understory tree. They have a beautiful heart-shaped leaf, gorgeous purplish red flowers that flower before it leaves out in the really early spring. You'll see one that we have here. It's just, it's a really beautiful cultivar. So we thought, okay, planting some Cersus canadensis in here because we don't want the trees to be too large. You know, that Celtis occidentalis, that's probably gonna be some of the larger of the, the, the trees because we don't, again, we don't, we wanna bring some of this. This is south coming this way, so south facing. We wanna bring in some of that light into that uh, forest so we could do some uh, agroforestry and have a little bit of opportunity there. And if we plant trees that are within like that kind of 10 to 30 feet range, then I think that will be uh, good. Cornus florida, we already have a lot of cornus around here. Some of it's cornus cusa, but I think cornus florida, cornus moss. Cornus moss is not native, but it is a popular plant within permaculture circles. And it does provide some wildlife benefit as well. Get some more yellow flower. And then Himalayas virginiana. So that is our witch hazel, great medicinal. It's already in the forest. Um, there are some really interesting cultivars, so we'll determine whether we want to do any kind of cultivars or we'll go, go straight species. It's one of the few that actually flowers in the winter months, which is pretty neat, it's kind of fall, winter, so it gives a pollinator source really late in the season. You can see this is our Norway spruce here, and these are quite small. They look like they were all planted at the same time, right? So. What else do we have here? So, oh, mountain ash. I did plant one last year. I think it might have gotten eaten by the deer <laughs> a little bit, nibbled on before we got the deer exclusion fence. So that's Sorbus Americana, American mountain ash. Um, really beautiful, like kind of pinnate leaves. When I see that kind of pinnate leaf structure, I'm always like, oh, is that a nitrogen fixer? But I don't think that is a nitrogen fixer. And then shrubs. Chokeberry, that's aronia. We have a lot of that growing around here. Ceanothus, which is New Jersey tea. I think that would grow really well. Ilex reticulata, I wouldn't mind even planting more of that here. Viburnum species, we have quite a few, quite a number, and we have a lot of nice native viburnum. So these are, the, this is, like, I'm thinking about more shrub layer. And then a nitrogen fixer for this area because this is pretty, ridiculously rocky. I think they brought in a lot of stones over here too, and I'm not sure how um, available the nutrients are right now for, for plants, but uh, buffalo berry, Shepardia canadensis. You know, that's a native nitrogen fixer that could be interesting. Haven't seen it here. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist here, but that could be quite nice. And then um, I'm thinking vines. There's a few vines. I mean, we always have uh, Parthenocissus kinkafolia, five fingers or Virginia creeper. That's a popular one that you would see in the forest. We could also go with the American hog peanut. Um, Vitus, of course, grapes is a good one. We'd have, you might be growing up on the trees. Maybe we could even build like some kind of structure for that to grow up on. Uh, hardy kiwi is another possibility. I really liked what we saw at the Hortus and they had this kind of circular structure where the hardy kiwi was growing on and you could actually walk into the structure. And this area is about, I would say, an acre. This is an acre strip, right? And we are thinking even, it could be a possibility that we could put some tiny houses here because they're out looking at the meadow and overlooking three ponds right here. They get some great sun. You could do some like passive style tiny homes. And if we take out some of these Norway spruce, we could turn them into wood chips or we could lay them around the deer exclusion fence. I think this was probably one of the multi-flora roses or yeah, it looks like a multi-flora rose that we had taken out but not ripped out. So that will have to be removed and burned. 
So, and then um, herbaceous layer. There's some things in the herbaceous layer that I, I know I would love here. And um, one is Mertensia virginiana, and that is Virginia bluebells. So you think about bluebell forests, you could think of Spanish bluebells, you could think of English bluebell forests, but we also have a native bluebell, which is actually related to comfrey, except it doesn't have that tillage root that goes all the way down and pulls up all those nutrients. It's actually a spring ephemeral. And it's very beautiful. It has a, a nice blue little flower, very similar to comfrey. So growing that here, it's an understory plant, I think would be gorgeous. Aquilegia, which is the columbine, and Baptisia, alba and australis. So if you have white and blue, they could get pretty, that herbaceous layer could actually get pretty shrubby. And uh, they're also nitrogen fixers, which is very good. The bluebells is not, but. And then ground covers. I think there's so many interesting ground covers that we could do that are native and that could provide food for wildlife and birds. And when I say food for wildlife and birds, <laughs> I'm kind of like birds, birds and wildlife before humans. Um, I, I do would like, I would like to see some, you know, food plants that humans really gravitate towards. Like we could do some malice, we could do some pears and stuff like that. Um, pears and apples over here. But um, I also want to prioritize, you know, birds and wildlife. And I think that, you know, service berries, hackberry, pin cherry, those are things that we typically wouldn't eat ourselves, but um, could be a really good wildlife food. And I think some of the ground covers, bearberry, um, aronia, another, you could get some aronia uh, ground covers, cornus canadensis. I already ended up doing a pre-order for cornus canadensis. It's a bunchberry. Uh, I had it planted up in the underneath the weeping white pine. And then Gaultheria procumbens and Hispidula. So that's like the creeping snowberry and also the winter green. And those are wonderful. You could just take those leaves and like chew on them. They have a little winter green flavor. And uh, I can imagine some of those throughout here. You know, just seeding the area really and then seeing what sticks. But of course, we're gonna have to manage this in a very similar way that we did the meadow, which is actually, you know, removing some of this uh, goldenrod out, which again, it's not a bad thing. It is a clonal plant. It does put out uh, chemicals to prevent anything else from growing. And it actually uh, does sh uh, share a disease with the white pine. So sometimes it can affect the white pine. That was something that we learned from our forester. So you can see all these little, not dead sticks, but they are sticks. And right before the goldenrod went to seed, Sonder actually came in here and cut a bunch of it. I mean, I'm sure we have seed in the seed bank after all these years, but um, we're doing what we can. In the meantime, when we were busy with other projects to do what we could do to just manage this so it's a little easier going into this year. But you could also see, I wanna point this out in the distance, this tree right here, you could see the blonding. That's emerald ash borer. All these trees are gonna have to go. Probably turn them into firewood. So we're getting some, got some wood stoves, but all of this, you see, that's where they exit. And uh, unfortunately, all these ash trees are gonna go. So again, that's another tree in our forest that is failing. We had a really bad gypsy moth year, a lot of the oak and the beech were hit, a lot of the poplar were hit, quaking aspens. That was challenging. It might be a really bad year this year again. Um, and that's a shame because this is primarily an oak hickory forest. And then you could see the beech tree right there, the one that keeps its leaves on. And a lot of our beech have beech bark disease. It's very common in this area. So, our white pine, you know, it's, it's a new age and relatively new age stand. They're kind of growing back all strangely and weirdly because they were all cut down at one point for lumber. Um, so we have a lot of work to do in this forest. And we think we're slowly, the meadow and the, the bulb lawn was like a big project this past year, but we're slowly starting to move into the forest. So. For us, this interstitial is going to be next. It's going to be a big landscaping project. 
on top of the renovation that we're doing on the tiny house. So that's what I wanted to share with you, but I'd love your thoughts. I mean, many of you practice kind of permaculture, kind of have good planting ideas. So share with us what you think, what could be actually good in this area. Um, we'd love to consider it. So you could leave all those in the comments below. And uh, thanks guys, we'll see you in the next video. We're going to be working on the area throughout the year and we'll keep you posted on how it progresses. In the meantime, you can keep up to date by subscribing to the channel and hitting the notifications button. We're reinvesting 10% of our Google AdSense revenue back into the local community. So watching and subscribing, you're helping support the larger vision and we'll see you in the next video.